Uh, hi, my name is Zach Wambua. I work with Map Kibira as a, as a lead mapper. When the first case of coronavirus was reported in Kenya, I remember very well uh, I was still in the office. And then when the news came out, uh, the story uh, spread very fast uh, in, in Kibera. And people got so afraid. Uh, you could see it everywhere that we were moving around. That was the main discussion that people were having. And everyone was like, uh, finally, uh, the disease is here with us. And there was a lot of fear. Uh, how this is going to affect the, uh, the people of Kibera, considering the nature of the of the area, how closely the houses are constructed next to each other, and other things like how people live in a communal setup. So when you are waking up or you are going to job, you are bound to come to close interaction with someone. So there was that fear that if this disease happens to penetrate into the slum, then it will create a great havoc in the community and there would be high number of casualties. The other thing that was going around that time was uh, there was a lot of misinformation how uh, the disease doesn't affect black people, uh, the disease doesn't affect children and because of the nature of the of our weather that meant that people cannot uh, get the disease. So there was a lot of misinformation that was moving, uh, going around and we realized that People are living in fear because of all this misinformation. People are not getting the right information. And so because of that, we set up a Kenya COVID-19 tracker platform in partnership with Ushahidi, uh, where we aim was to curb the mis misinformation that was going around in providing uh, the people of Kibera with the relevant and up-to-date information about the disease, the events that are happening around, the, uh, the reports that are being released by the Ministry of Health daily, and some reliable information like washing hands, keeping distance, and if you happen to get these symptoms, the best approach to take uh, to seek uh, medical attention. So all this information we are gathering from different sources and posting them on the Shady platform and sharing also back to the community. The other thing that we are also doing, we realized uh, one of the biggest challenges that, that the people of Kibera were, were facing was uh, they are being directed to wash their hands. Then there's that challenge of uh, inadequate resources such as water, uh, running water in those homes. Most people access water from water taps that are mounted outside their homes. So people don't have like running water in their homes. So this was going to, uh, was proving to be a challenge. So as an organization through the, the platform, we were also mapping other resources that are being provided by different organizations in the community. So there are a lot of organizations that were coming on the ground and already existing organizations uh, offering support to the community, like uh, putting up hand wash points uh, in, in strategic points to provide uh, clean water and uh, and soap to wash their hands. And there was a lot, a lot of sensitization that was also going around uh, about the disease and how to make sure that you, you follow the directives that are given by the government to flatten the curve. So through the platform, we have been mapping cases, different cases that, as they are reported by the Minister of Health and also mapping out different resources uh, provided by, by different organizations. This is to make sure that also there is uh, equitable distribution of resources within the community and also working closely with organizations, seeing how they can be able to use this information to supplement some of the activities that are already going on. So the platform uses OSM uh, base map. So as people are also interacting with the information that we are putting up on the site, they are also able to interact with the OSM data uh, on the base map. So they're able, as they are zooming in to see reports as they are being posted on the on the on the platform, they can also be able to see uh, already existing data on OSM uh, in specific area. So we are not only working in Kibera; that was our main focus. But we are also mapping out other cases and other resources around Nairobi in other informal settlements of Nairobi and also countrywide. So we recently got a funding from uh, HOT through the Rapid Response uh, uh, Grant to support the work that we are doing uh, around uh, COVID-19 mapping and also covering stories uh, that are related to COVID-19 in Kibera and other parts of Kenya. Asante. Hi everyone, my name is Carolina Koth. 
an advocacy and operations lead for women in JS Kenya, and we're excited to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Nungwisello Morage. I'm the research and development lead at Women in JS Kenya. Hi guys, my name is Sophia Njeri Murage, the technical lead for women in JS Kenya. Also super excited to be here. Uh, hi guys, my name is Yari Wokitio. I'm the strategy and business lead at Women in JS Kenya. Also really excited excited to be here. Um, so the main goal why we formed JS, Women in JS Kenya was um, from our own personal experiences and it was all towards building an inclusive society that is able to celebrate women but at the same time enable women and create create an enabling environment for women and mentor them to become the best version of, the self, of themselves within the geospatial space. So that was the main inspiration of Women in JS Kenya and we've really grown beyond that. And that's what we want to focus on today, our projects and our data visualization challenges and how we aim to integrate this within uh, OpenStreetMap. Yeah. So at Women in JS Kenya, we work, uh, we work focusing on solving, highlighting and solving women issues. Uh, and we work within four pillars. Uh, one on mentorship, uh, two on projects, uh, three on events and networking, and then the fourth one on data visualization challenges. And today, for, for this specific talk, we're going to focus on our, on our project's community mapping using data visualization challenges, uh, fo focusing on the projects that we've been able to cover so far. Uh, that's on cervical cancer awareness and also gender-based violence, and a future one that uh, actually just launched on teenage pregnancies in Kenya. Yeah, maybe I can speak a bit on the first, like, cervical cancer. Um, we did this challenge early on in this year, and it was a great challenge where we saw uh, several outcomes from it where we were able to see various information that would be useful for the public such as um, where one can go for testing of cervical cancer for features um, various information that would be useful for the public on what type of test and how uh, and what it actually means when it comes to cervical cancer and some of this information is very key and important for people out there and therefore beyond just having these challenges our next step will de definitely go into uh, working with the community again to ensure that this information is made publicly available like on OSM. So a key benefit that has occurred as we progress with the projects that we've worked on, including from the cervical cancer to a project on gender-based violence, our COVID response project, we got a very rich data set, curated data set on health uh, practitioner distribution as well as health facilities in the country. And this project has shown us that we, uh, we've become a major conduit to gather information from a community based from uh, um, sourcing. And this allows us to be able to gather very curated, very um, fresh data that we can be able to contribute to SM. And we hope to contribute further with further projects that we're able to get into. I think what makes uh, OSM the obvious platform to go to is the fact that it's driven by communities and it's for communities. That's the very basis of what drives OSM and that's the very basis of what drives women in JS projects. Our projects are mainly to address gender-based um, gender issues and, to, and we do that by amplifying the voices of women. And OSM is a really good platform simply because it brings about inclusivity and enables everyone to access this data. And that's why it, I think it's really futuristic for women in JS Kenya and for us as the team to push all our data there to enable researchers, developers, programmers, knowledge experts, and anyone who's interested in accessing this data to build or innovate around gender issues. So I'm sure you will be asking why uh, and how we will be able to make this happen. Uh, we are going to be hosting a mapathon soon uh, for, for us to enable our community and different communities that would like to come together to do this. Uh, so during this mapathon, we'll make available the data sets that we've been using on health facilities. Um, where cervical cancer is available, where cervical cancer services are available, uh, to also make available uh, data sets on kind of tests and screening that is available for, for cervical cancer, to also make available data sets on GBV, um, safe houses, GBV areas where you can report, and also where you can go for support if you, if you fall pregnant from teenage pregnancies. Yeah. So we have gathered and learned a lot from various communities such as OSM that allowed us to get to where we are as women in JS. And we are very, very excited to contribute back and to give back to this community. So we as women in JS are very excited to be part of State of the Map. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.
Hi, my name is Stefan Keller. This lightning talk is about an important question. But before continuing, please allow me to switch off the camera right now again, so that you can get a full view on the slides. This is about the following question. Where can you dine like a king? And uh, it's about synchronizing local datasets and OpenStreetMap using QGIS. I've written a white paper, a draft on this topic, and it's indicated here on the wiki page and at the end of those slides. And mentioning QGIS, that's a cross-platform desktop geographic information system application. It's open source and not that much more complicated than JOSM, I think. Over the recent years, I've got asked more than once about one or, or more use cases as I've compiled here. I will mention only the first one because of time. So as a gastronomer, I'm compiling a list of restaurants with comments which have the ambience of a real castle. And we want still to be in sync with OpenStreetMap. How can we do that? As many of you know, the means to extract OpenStreetMap data is to use Overpass Turbo. And I have defined a query which defines an area of Switzerland, gets me all castles, and then all restaurants within 30 meters. It, the output is uh, center, which means area objects in OpenStreetMap are being calculated as, uh, and converted to a point. This is an example of a workflow using uh, the OSM DataSync plugin. We start with setting all up. And the most interesting thing is that we convert the GeoJSON file we get from the Overpass Turbo query to GeoPackage and within QGIS, we enhance the schema with two mandatory attributes. One is the OSM ID and the other one is the state. And then we start curating the data set. Uh, we edit it and uh, by pushing synchronize, we keep up to date. This is a detail page which uh, shows all the different possible states. And I have to make it short because of the lack of time. So let's start with the first part, which is the fake data. And you see um, six features, um, which have a, a primary key FID, and uh, which have an ID, and which have a name from OpenStreetMap, which have a, a cuisine and comments. And the comments is a local uh, attribute I've added, and it's which is maintained locally. And there is this important synchronization state. The synchronization is being done uh, through the OpenStreetMap ID, like this one here. And now you see indicated in red changes and I have made um, in this case, because that's the setup phase, the first edition, it's a, a comment of mine. I also, uh, as a user, flagged this feature uh, to be ignored because it's not interesting. And I have also added locally this feature. Then um, I've pushed the synchronization button and I'm getting back seven records, one more as before for OpenStreetMap since in the meantime, there has been a, a record, a new one being added by someone in OpenStreetMap. Those two um, records remain unchanged and um, even this one um, remains unchanged. So my comment goes untouched. This is a feature not found in OpenStreetMap, so I delete it locally also, the feature number three, and then uh, feature number one and two are two examples of change. This is a preview. It's a mocked up graphical user interface of the new OSM DataSync QGIS plugin. And let's move right to the left down uh, where we see um, uh, controls in order to iterate over the features. We see uh, currently feature number three shown with uh, this node 
And um, the most important information here is that we have radio buttons to control the sync state, which is currently unchanged. Typically, a user would change the state manually to ignored or to local. You surely ask if there is an answer of where you can dine like a king in Switzerland. And I've made a small map on the UMAP indicated here as well as I've indicated the repository where I welcome feedback on this URL. And did I mention which is the most beautiful campus of Switzerland? Have a look at the following slide. Goodbye. Sa and Kyora, I am Mapmaker David, and I would like to share with you how we are nurturing the Ministry of Mapping in the Philippines. Who cares for the map makers who care? Map makers, especially those in the open data and open geospatial communities, care a lot about the world. We volunteer to help those people in crises. We provide data for the commons and maintain the tech behind it. We nurture a lot of relationships between many communities. We carry and write memories of how mapping was done before, even plan what should be done later in the future. We do these as part of the OpenStreetMap, Phosphor-G, and wider mapping communities, and so much more. These labors are more difficult to do if you come from a historically marginalized and structurally oppressed background and present, like we map makers in the Philippines. Who cares for the map makers who care? We map makers in the Philippines and in the Pacific in general face common intersecting issues as listed here. And these things prevent us from contributing meaningfully and consistently to projects like OpenStreetMap and Phosphor-G. There are so many risks and dangers that we face, even from fellow mappers. Uh, some of us are even struggling to put food on the table. Map makers are people too, and we shouldn't forget that. So when the pandemic happened, we wanted to figure out an organizational way of helping communities while making sure that our own health as geospatial workers are insured. We also wanted to include those who, while not being regular data and tech contributors to OpenStreetMap and Phosphor-G, are so integral in making sure that mapping becomes excellent and respectful. People like writers, reporters, mental health experts, etc. And we were trying to figure out the social glues that hold map makers and their communities together. Let's take a step back. When our ancestors were exploring the greatest ocean on Earth, the Pacific, they were relying not only on themselves and their knowledge, but on their com communities. This is a, a map I made about Ausonisha, which is a map made in the tradition of the stick charts. I believe that we Pacific map makers have the capability and capacity to be one of the best map makers of, on Earth if we only take care of each other more properly. Hence the Ministry of Mapping. We are a geospatial collective cared for and owned by geospatial workers and we want to serve the people with open geospatial data tech and science through open and fair work here we are the current members of the collective uh, which is slowly uh, growing through the months and i just want to thank everyone who helped us in this journey and everyone who are still doing the work so for now we are trying to figure out how to relate to each other better through a code of conduct. We want to call it cartography for now, a code of kindness for a mapping community. With this code of conduct, we want to create a fertile and caring environment for diversity, fairness, connecting initiatives. We are supported by a disaster clinical psychologist named Dr. John Gilaran. You support open data and open tech geospatial projects like those in OpenStreetMap and Phosphor-G. We want to maintain our ties with various communities in the Philippines and in the Pacific in general. We discuss 
what the right thing to do is in every uh, important step. And most of all, we focus on relationships with people and land. This is the core of the code of conduct for now. That the map maker and any community member in the Ministry of Mapping are more important than the maps and the mapping. And that the community being mapped is more important than the map maker, maps, and mapping combined. If you really want to realize these principles, and we hope you can join us in this journey in becoming the Ministry of Mapping. Thank you very much. Salamat po. Aroha nui. And see you next time. My name is Ayo Akinsei. I will be presenting a lightning talk on building the Street View Experience, Lagos, Nigeria. This talk is recorded for State of the Map 2020. In this time of the pandemic, I hope you guys are staying safe. So why did we decide on this route? Um, we discovered that maps of Nigeria were generally out of date and inaccurate regardless of platform. And we thought about if we added another layer, such as a street view, it will improve accuracy since you'll be able to see where the user is going to and coming from. And also to generally create a better web geo experience for users. So how were we going to go about this was to create a 2D web map for reference and should use on click with a marker identifying either where the user was or where the user wanted to see. And to get that done, we had to capture and process 360 degree panoramas. We had to zone the city into drive zones and we had to upload street view zone by zone. Uh, this is uh, the website, which I would go through quickly, and I've shared the links at the end of the presentation. So, on the landing page, you, you have register and share your location, quickly find locations on the street view and share directions with your friends, which basically summarizes some of what we're trying to achieve. Then in this middle area, we have the neighborhoods within Lagos that we have covered, and there's the others as well, which we actually have in processing, since panoramas take um, quite a bit of work to do. Also, there's a search box here, which um, if I search for Adeola Odeko, which is a pretty popular road in Victoria Island, and um, the map takes us there. In the lower left corner, what is loading is the correspondent street view. And once it loads that, I will be able to switch between the 2D map view, which is the open street map view, and that corresponding one. Now the open street map has been minimized to the overview on the left. And you can see the direction in which the camera or the view is facing. And as you pan around, it gets you to see where exactly you're facing in relation to that location. So why OpenStreetMap? OpenStreetMap is an amazing 2D mapping platform. Um, I, have a GI, I have a GIS background, and I have been watching the OpenStreetMap developments from time. So even when this project came up, it was the platform of choice based on the fact that it has a, also has a huge user and contributor community, of which I am one as well. And it's also very easy to learn and contribute. In some of the mapathons that we have done, we find out that even um, people with little or no computer knowledge can actually navigate their way around ID, which is the online tool. One of the great considerations to OpenStreetMap for this project was we could build our own tile server and services, which is um, what you just saw. So Moribo means I have seen it in Yoruba. Um, Yoruba is a language, one of the 200 plus languages in Nigeria, spoken by people mostly in the Southwest and also in West African countries. Uh, basically helping users to find and locate places, sharing locations with the street views. Um, then we also try to update every six months now, since we've been actively capturing data since 2016, we're working on a time series um, view, whereby you'll be able to see one location over time. 
So Moriwo uh, supports OpenStreetMap through OSM Nigeria, that's the Twitter handle, and the Mapathons and local community building that I mentioned earlier. In 2017, we uploaded some test data of streets in Lagos and Ibadan. That's two cities in the southwest of Nigeria to Mapillary, just to see uh, how well things go there. And um, the company provides street view capture services and also end-to-end -end bills of similar platforms like this. Moriwo is a child of a company called Simple Mobile. Thank you. Uh, this is my email, my Twitter handle, and my OpenStreetMap handle as well. So please let me know if you have questions, and I hope in this brief presentation I've shared enough. Thank you. Hello, I am Willie. I am the creator and maintainer of SMCHA. And today I will talk about some of the new features that we have added to SMCHA on the last months. For those who don't know what SMCHA is, it's a tool that helps us to validate the edits made on opposite map. We register on our database all the chain sets, and then we run some analysis to identify potential problems on each edit. And we also provide a better visualization of the chain sets so you can see easily what was modified, what was created or deleted on in the chain set. So here, for example, uh, I have a chain set that had modified 21 uh, elements. So we can click on each feature, see the text that change, and also we can see if the geometry change. In that case, for example, the user changed from waterway canal to ditch, what is a correct edit because it's really uh, a ditch or a drain, not a canal. So we can tag it as good. So if uh, someone else came to come to that chain set to verify it, uh, they can see that it was already reviewed. Another possibility that we have uh, on SMCHA is to search for chain sets and also we can save that filters. You can use uh, a lot of information to filter, like dates, comments, location. Uh, today, let's try with filtering by buildings, large buildings added by new users. So I can apply that filter. Uh, let's get that first chain set. One of the new features that we have on SMCHA is the possibility to visualize the members of a relation. So, for example, we have that uh, yellow box, that which means uh, the B box of a relation that was modified. So here we have a, a relation that changed from reservoir, from end use reservoir, to building yes, what is uh, a very bad change. So here we can check each element of the relation. Here on that second column, we have the rule of that member on the relation. And you can inspect it to see if the relation is complete. And here we can open that feature on ID, on JOSM, or on level zero, and also check the history on some of some, some services. A new feature that we also have is the possibility to use the Bing layer. Uh, we always had the Mabox satellite streets and dark layer. So now we can switch to Bing and I hope it will help us to validate the chain sets. So here we can see that it was which is really a reservoir, not a building, and we can tag it as bad. Here we can also uh, mark some additional information on the chain set, like if it was resolved or unresolved. Uh, I, I, I need yet to open it on it to, to, to make the fix on the chain set. Uh, talk a little bit about the possibility of uh, visualize the relation members, uh, which is very useful when we are reviewing, for example, the 
the time restrictions. So, for example, here we we flag the invalid time description. It's uh, no left term with only from and to members. It's missing the via member. If we open the old version of that feature um, that or the chain set, we can confirm that uh, it had the from via and to members. So we can open it on editor as well. And also tag that change that change set as bad. So um, thank you very much and keep validating your SMCHA. Good day everyone. I will be sharing with you an advocacy that is dear to my heart. First of all, my name is Arna Lee. I'm up for work as a GIS specialist for the Department of Social Welfare and Development. I also map voluntarily through OpenStreetMap. Together with my colleagues, we reinitiate JU Ladies PH. You may ask, did she just say reinitiate? Yes, I did, because actually, JU Ladies was first convened in 2014 by a longtime OSM contributor here in the Philippines, who is Mr. Manning Sambana. Back in 2014, Mr. Manning observed that most Mapathon and Mapping Party participants are men. So with this, he wanted to bridge the gap and change the ratio. We are very delighted about this initiative and in 2018, we revived it. As JU Ladies advocates in community diversity, collaborative participation, and up affirmative spaces for women and underrepresented communities in OpenStreetMap and the local geospatial science community. We are helping and hosting mapping activities that we support, such as Boxy Testing Center with the SWD, Mental Health Awareness, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Team Projects, Map the Philippines Projects, OSM Map Aralan, and LGBTQ Friendly Spaces. We are currently a group of six ladies, also called the JO Ladies PH core team. We have Andy, who advocates for mapping mental health resources, Faye, a disaster response mapper, Cham, an artist mapper, Jen, an advocate of mapping breastfeeding stations, and Lay, a drone expert. I mentioned earlier that we revived it in 2018, and this was through Mapa Mapa Babae is an annual mapping activity by the SWD celebrated every March or the Women's Month. It is focused on identifying mapping priorities of women and present mapping projects of women in underrepresented sectors. The first JU Ladies PH event is actually during Pistanang Mapa 2019, which is last year. We had a workshop entitled When Women Web, where participants are asked to map facilities which are important to them. We also had the drone workshop last August 2019, and we also attended a she maps and Philippine Flying Labs drone training this January. We also support Andy's project, Mental Health Awareness Mapping, to promote mental health awareness to fight the stigma on it. And after five years from 2014, we had the JLATIS Mitch Up meet up which was held in 2019 and we had another one last December. We also participated during the Open Data Day 2020 celebration here in the Philippines. And so what's next for JU Ladies? Uh, we want to continue to engage more women mappers and JU Ladies here in our country. We also aim to launch the JU Ladies PH community group to build wider networks. We will also continue to participate and support local and international mapping initiatives that promote diversity and inclusiveness, especially for women and underrepresented groups. Since there is still a COVID situation here, our main channel will be online meetups and webinars cater for women in the, in the spatial field. Thank you for taking the time to view my talk. Please catch these awesome Filipino speakers here in State of the Map 2020. And if you have any questions, you may drop them in the chat or visit us at our Facebook page at JLadiesPH. 
Thank you. Hello, my name is Janet Chapman from Crowd to Map Tanzania talking about fighting female genital mutilation or FGM with maps. So FGM is the cutting of female genitalia for cultural or religious reasons and it has major health implications. It's illegal in Tanzania but very prevalent in particularly in certain areas because it's generally certain tribes that still practice this and girls are rounded up during a cutting season while they're on school holidays and cut. So we've been working with Roby Samwelly from Hope for Girls and Women over the last six years, and she does outreach work in the villages of Serengeti and Butiama in Mara region, and tells people around the effects of FGM. She also runs two safe houses for girls refusing FGM. She's a FGM survivor herself. She almost bled to death when she was cut aged 14. But girls cannot find the safe houses easily and safe house staff and the police cannot find them because rural Tanzania is very poorly mapped, unlike places like Dar es Salaam or London where I live. So activists and the police and everybody needs um, maps of rural Tanzania. So we've been making them since 2015 with the help of global volunteers from all over the world and also people on the ground in Tanzania. So we're using satellite images such as this one, which shows some um, huts um, where people live in this area. Um, People generally sign up through UN online volunteers and other volunteering sites. We send them an email with some detailed instructions about getting started with OpenStreetMap and also how to use Rapid, um, which is generating machine learning um, generated buildings and roads that we're also using to help. And also tagging guides and explanations about road tagging, etc. So we um, ask people to join our Slack channel, which now has over four and a half thousand members and post some examples of the mapping, um, their first attempts at mapping and then more experienced mappers give them feedback. So if you'd like to help with this, please get involved. We're, we're always looking for more volunteers. We've also set up some quizzes um, so people can test their knowledge about mapping. So has, they include screenshots of typical problems. And if you get 100%, then you get a badge for that particular module. We've also been adding um, open government data such as clinic locations, uh, which is extremely useful, and using water point locations to work out missing villages, which is also useful for COVID tracing. So um, since we began, we've now up to almost 14,000 volunteers um, and a total of 6.4 million edits. Uh, we were recently featured in the podcast Nodes and Ways, but we were all, the most important thing that we're doing is training people on the ground in Tanzania to map their own communities mostly using a free smartphone app called maps.me. So here are some people adding their village for the first time. We've been training um, activists um, and many people, including the police, to use um, maps.me to route them to find places that they need to go, for example, to rescue girls quickly. Typically, they would get a phone call in the middle of the night saying girls are about to be cut in Kabanchu Banchu village. That wasn't previously on any map. There's no road signs, no street lights. So it was very difficult for them to find them and girls were missed. We've been um, training people to use smartphones for the first time to map their villages and then producing paper maps 
and they can also add the places that are still missing and then display the map in the village office. This is the first time people have seen a map of their village. So better maps have helped prevent um, many girls from being cut by finding the safe houses. Every time there is a cutting season, uh, girls bleed to death and die. So this has reduced the death rate from that. So we've trained over 1,600 local activists to map their communities in Tanzania. Around 40% of these are female. This has greatly helped when we got a micro grant from Humanitarian Open Street Map, which allowed us to buy some cheap $30 smartphones. Generally, women in the villages do not have access to smartphones. We've set up um, eight different youth mapper chapters in Tanzania that we continue to work with. In 2018, we were invited to run a mapathon as part of the UN General Assembly and we had satellite events um, in many different countries so thank you to everybody who helped with that. Um, we're always looking for new volunteers, um, we're, in, we're all volunteers with virtually no budget. Um, if you'd like to get involved please do get in touch and let me know. Uh, thank you very much for listening.